We're going to go ahead and get started. Hello. All right, so we're going to get started. And uh, first of all, welcome and thank you for attending our second installment of our Leaders in Education lunch, lunch series. Uh, my name is Dave Call. I'm the Office Managing Member of the Cleveland Office. And today, I'm privileged and delighted to have with us Brian Barron, who is the president of business operations for the Cleveland Indians. So thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for having me, Dave. So before we get started, I want to do a little housekeeping. Uh, first of all, if you're in the audience here in Cleveland, you have these little forms at your chairs. If you have any questions, fill them out, and then they'll be picked up by someone in our staff. If you're on our webcast, uh, just click on the button uh, for questions, submit your question, and they'll be delivered to me up here. Um, all I ask is, you know, let's try to keep the questions to the topic at hand, which is education. I know everyone wants to know about Frankie Lindor's contract and <laughs> whether or not Kluber's going to come back, you know, and when. So let's try not to focus on those questions. Let's focus on the education questions. So with that, uh, you might ask, again, why McDonnell Hopkins is so interested in education. And to be honest with you, this really kind of started about a year ago. Um, I was part of the leadership uh, class of 2019, best class ever, right? I have some of my classmates here in attendance. Um, and we learned a lot of the good and the bad about Northeast Ohio. And you know, some of the things that were disturbing is, first of all, is that we have an undereducated workforce clearly in Northeast Ohio. And what has been proven is that an undereducated workforce leads to poverty. So what's that matter to McDonald Hopkins? Well, we are a service business, and if companies are not going to come to Northeast Ohio or stay in Northeast Ohio, the problem is we cannot succeed as a service industry, whether you're in a law firm, a bank, financial institution, or an accounting firm. So what can we do about it? So instead of just sitting there and saying, hey, this is a problem and we're not going to do anything about it, McDonald Hopkins kind of thought about it and said, we are going to try to make a difference. We are going to try to make a change. And so what we've done is, you know, we've always been involved in community outreach efforts. Um, they just haven't been targeted. So what we decided to do is we're going to focus on education. Um, since our last time with Eric Gordon, uh, the firm has announced that we are going to make an education initiative firm-wide. So in all of our markets, we are focusing on education because in our minds, we need to increase and improve the educational standards in the communities that we serve. Otherwise, we're not going to benefit. And we also feel that we can make a bigger bang for the buck by focusing on education as our primary source. So that's why we're here. But enough about McDonald Hopkins. Um, let's talk about Brian. Um, so Brian is a 1989 graduate of Princeton. Um, where I found it was very interesting, Brian, as part of his degree in history, uh, wrote his senior thesis on the integration uh, in major, ba major League Baseball. And I asked him before this, geez, you know, was, did you, was this forethought that you would eventually work for a Major League Baseball team? And he said, no way. Um, but what's interesting about it is Brian also played football at Princeton, um, where he was the backup quarterback to Jason Garrett. Some of you may recognize the name Jason Garrett. He's now the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and so after Princeton, he also went and he worked for Procter & Gamble. He spent 24 years at Procter & Gamble. And then also what was interesting is he's been a lifelong Indians fan. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting about his ba background. But what scared me when I was reading about Brian is that he was a tank commander in the ROTC. <laughs> uh, so um, got to watch out for Brian with that. Um, so the way I'm going to handle today is I want to talk about the past, the present, and the future. And I think that will give kind of a little bit of insight into Brian uh, personally, but also what the Indians are doing. Because I think as a community, we really need 
to thank the Indians and understand what they're doing in the community from an educational perspective. So with that, you know, let's kind of just jump into it. And I forgot to mention, as we're going through, I will try to answer, you know, have questions presented from the audience. So feel free to submit it. People will walk around um, and collect those cards from you. So please do that. Um, so with that, so Brian, you grew up in Columbus, Ohio, where your dad was a high school football coach. Um, you were the fifth child of six. So I could imagine what went on in your household with your dad being a football coach. But you know, the first question I have for you is, so what did you learn from your dad um, regarding the importance of education in the lives of teenagers? Uh, you know, we, we learned a couple of things. In, in our household, uh, you learn how to, to hustle uh, because you had to be on time for things. And uh, if you weren't hustling, you might miss a meal or you might miss a helping at, at a meal. Uh, <laughs> My father was, was an educator, uh, and he was a teacher uh, and a coach. The teacher part came first. Uh, he was a big believer that education uh, is the foundation upon which you'll build your life. And education affords anybody the opportunity to change the trajectory of, of their lives. Uh, for us in our household, we were very, very fortunate. Uh, we grew up believing we're gonna to go to college. Uh, all of us did, all of us graduated from college. Uh, how we were gonna do that and what that looked like, uh, we didn't know, but the culture within the household was, you're all gonna to go to college uh, and, and that's gonna be important. And at the end of the day, uh, going as far as you can from an education standpoint is critically important in life. As, as Dave highlighted, we certainly have an opportunity here in Cleveland to unlock uh, you know, a, a very important aspect that, that could provide a, a window or a path away from poverty. Whether that, that as far as you can go is high school, a two-year degree, a four-year degree, an advanced degree, uh, it's doing the best that you can to compete in the classroom to achieve your full potential as a student. Uh, and, and that was something that was instilled in all of us at a very young age. So based on that, I'm sure your dad uh, gave you a lot of pearls of wisdom. What was the one that stuck in your mind? What was the best advice he ever gave you in connection with you know, your background in education? Uh, I would say the best piece of advice from my father was uh, put the team ahead of, of me. Put the team ahead of the individual. Uh, you know, what does that have to do with education? Um, wherever he was a teacher and a coach, uh, you were not eligible for extracurricular activities if you weren't passing your classes. Um, so putting the team ahead of yourself meant taking care of your, your job in the classroom. Uh, to be a, a great teammate, the first step in that process was to actually be eligible to participate. Um, and whether that's in the band, in the theater, on the athletic field, uh, to be participating, participating in extracurricular activities um, you had to take care of job number one, which was get it done in the classroom. Um, that was instilled in us, and the concept of competing in the classroom to achieve your full potential was, was another important attribute or aspect. Uh, it wasn't about get the highest grade in the class. Uh, it was about make sure you're preparing yourself to be successful in the classroom. Um, we've all probably been there where you get the pop quiz and you're not prepared and you don't do as well as you think you can and at the end of the day learning that you need to be accountable for that. Uh, if, if what's important to you is, is competing and for many of my brothers and sisters it was competing in extracurricular athletics, um, you need to make sure you're really focused on taking care of the job in the classroom as, as the top priority. So who is the best in the family? <laughs> uh, in the classroom, my oldest brother, Mike, <laughs> on the athletic fields, my, my next oldest brother, uh, Mark, and my, my sisters, I was flanked by my two sisters, and uh, they, they probably pushed me and kept me in check more than anybody else in the family. <laughs> That's funny. So let, let's kind of move on to your uh, stint at P&G, only 24 years. I mean, that wasn't that long. But anyway, um, you were very successful at Procter & Gamble. And one of the things I, I, I found interesting is that you put together these multifunctional customer business development teams. That's a mouthful. But w what was interesting about that is, because you've already focused on teamwork and education, 
What did you learn putting together these teams at, at Procter & Gamble, and what kind of brought that to the foresight for, with you? That's, that's a great question, and you know, p and is a fantastic company. Uh, the evolution of what Procter & Gamble calls customer business development was a reflection of changing marketplace conditions, uh, you know, first in the U.S. and then around the world. Um, when I started in the late 1980s, uh, you know, if, if you use the proverbial whale tail, the 20% of your customers to get to 80% of your business, it would take 100 customers in the United States. By the time I left, uh, it was less than 10. So the importance for the company um, of approaching customers in more of a business-to-business -business, uh, environment where you needed finance and logistics and human resources and information technology and marketing and market research and sales um, was something Procter & Gamble started experimenting with uh, pretty early. And I was fortunate to have an opportunity to, to learn firsthand on Procter & Gamble's Walmart global customer team and lived down in Fayetteville uh, for uh, six years and uh, a, a tremendous environment to learn the importance of, of teams and multidisciplinary teams uh, as it relates to developing business plans, uh, codifying work processes to get work done, um, and then developing people. As, as leaders, it was paramount that uh, you developed your, your people, acquiring talent, uh, and then developing talent to achieve uh, to their full potential, no matter what that may be. And that was kind of the talent management framework that was instilled from a leadership standpoint. You were expected to develop and, and help others achieve to their full potential. So when you came up with the idea of putting together these teams, what was the initial reaction at P&G? Uh, skepticism. Uh, you know, at, at, at times, uh, I'm sure for, for many of you, the, uh, uh, the, the pioneers, the first that go out there, uh, are, are often subject to the most criticism. And when something actually works, uh, which may come after several failed attempts, uh, you, you tend to get a lot of folks, spectators, uh, saying that that was a great, you know, I, I knew we should have done that. We should have done it 10 years ago. Um, customer business development at, at Procter & Gamble, and I'm sure for many of you in the room, is, is uh, it's not a spectator sport. It requires active participation. Um, market conditions change very rapidly. Uh, being very evidence-based and, and trying to be objective in the decision-making process versus subjective and letting emotion creep into decisions uh, was critical. And I think one of the big pieces of learning at, at Procter & Gamble was the consumer, uh, the shopper who purchased product was, was the boss. And to the extent you could gather insight uh, from a behavioral standpoint on what those wants and needs were, that, that became the alpha omega. That would drive strategy within the company. Uh, and, and the translation certainly for a professional sports team was the fan is at the center of the universe for us. You really need to understand who that fan is and what their needs are. So I would, because this was a new endeavor at, at Procter & Gamble, how much time did you have to spend educating the teams on what the goals were and what they were trying to accomplish? Uh, qu quite a bit out of the box. Um, the, the, the first customer teams at, at P&G were learning uh, a lot on the fly. And many times the, the, uh, the hope from a senior leadership standpoint was uh, if, if you were an airplane, uh, and you were coming in maybe a little bit too fast and, and losing altitude too quickly, just try and catch wind before uh, you get to the runway and, and get back up in the air. And then share that learning uh, with, with your counterparts, with your, your teammates, um, it, with folks around the world. Uh, one of the great things about being a part of uh, a large company like that was folks genuinely cared about the success of others. Um, teamwork was, was very important. And on these multidisciplinary customer teams, the opportunity to learn from your counterparts uh, was as simple as park your car in the parking lot and show up in the office. Uh, you could ask the, uh, any question. The, the only dumb question, so to speak, was the one that you didn't ask. And y you could go into the office and learn about different aspects of the business um, f from your peers, which was wonderful. You could hop on the phone or get on a plane and go somewhere else in the world and find folks solving problems uh, and learn from that so that when you would face something in your specific business or in a certain region, 
it was very unusual uh, to not have, have faced that as a corporation somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And you could draw upon that network and the teams that, that actually had codified a lot of that learning so you could solve problems much more quickly. So this might come as a surprise, this question to you, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. So at your time at Procter & Gamble, what was the best lesson you learned that has now translated over to the Indians? Uh, don't be afraid to fail. Uh, make sure that uh, culturally uh, be accountable as a leader for making a choice, uh, having a, a, a big failure, uh, and then importantly learning from it. So that the lesson on the other side of that story is don't repeat the mistake, uh, but, but learn from that and embrace it. Share it with others. Um, you're probably going to make more mistakes. Uh, you know, with the exception of my time as a, as a tank commander, you know, failure is not fatal uh, in the business world. <laughs> there were times where failure, you know, you'd scratch your head and say, we better not mess this one up because the outcome might not be, might, might not be what we want it to be. Um, but learning from failure um, so that you can move forward uh, was, was probably the biggest takeaway. Okay. So one of your college um, uh, football players that you played with was Mark Shapiro. Um, so after 24 years at Procter & Gamble, he convinced you, it sounds like, to leave to join the Indians. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Uh, <laughs> you know, there were, there were a couple of reasons, and uh, I, I believe things happen for a reason. Um, in 2010, uh, Mark was asked by the, the Dolan family to lead the business uh, for the Indians, and he, he was a pioneer and a leader uh, from a baseball operations perspective. Uh, you know, Mark was a college football player. Uh, he, he was always asking why and trying to learn more. Uh, so w when it came to baseball, uh, from a player development standpoint, why were players developing at a faster rate or a slower rate than others? He, would, he wanted data, he wanted evidence, he wanted information to help learn uh, and then frame choices uh, in a sport where, frankly, your success as a, as a baseball leader um, from a baseball operations perspective is, is actually tied to the success of you know, performance of uh, younger guys in general. Um, as Mark was transitioning into a leadership role on the business side, uh, Chris Antonetti, who is our president of baseball operations and one of the best in, in the business, uh, frankly didn't need a lot of help. And, and as, as a leader, Mark gave him the space and empowered him uh, to, to be the, the leader that he is today. Uh, as Mark shifted his focus to the business side, uh, he naturally started to look outside of the baseball industry to try and learn best practices. Um, a vice chairman from Procter & Gamble actually ended up at a baseball game with Mark in 2010. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. We had a product recall going on in North America that, that had occurred on a Friday afternoon. You had 24 hours to prepare your response for the FDA. Uh, so we got the hall pass until Monday. Uh, and the leaders were working throughout the weekend. And I, I got an email from the vice chairman and from Mark, and it had the other one's name in the subject line. And I figured out pretty quickly they must be at a, at a baseball game up in Cleveland. Um, Mark actually asked the, the vice chairman at Procter & Gamble uh, two questions. One, he said, would, would Procter & Gamble be willing to share best practices with the Cleveland Indians? The vice chairman uh, said there's not a lot of overlap from a direct compete standpoint. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, and then Mark asked him if, if, he, if he happened to know me. At, at the time, P&G had 100,000 employees around the world. Um, and I, I happened to be reporting directly to that vice chairman. Um, so when P&G signed that bilateral confidentiality agreement, um, a small group of senior leaders started to work collaboratively with the Indians front office to share best practices. And I was exposed to the culture, um, the values, the belief system of uh, ownership and leadership within the Indians, uh, as well as the challenges of, of operating within a smaller market, uh, embracing that, not fighting it, not using it as, as an excuse, um, and looked forward to uh, taking an opportunity to see if some of the things that I had learned over the years at P&G um, might work in, in a different industry. And uh, it's, it's been a great experience thus far. Great. 
An interesting story. So let's try to transition to the present. Um, I'm going to start off by talking just briefly about how McDowell Hopkins got involved with the Indians. Um, so we became a community partner with the Indians back in 2017. And um, when I was asked to take over the office in October 2016, I met with the marketing group and I had three strategic initiatives. And one was to enhance our community outreach. And so we got together as a team and said, how are we going to do that? And we had various initiatives that we were going to try to accomplish. And so then uh, Deborah Kelm, the head of our marketing group, comes to me and says, oh, the Indians want to meet with you. I'm like, oh, great, what? They want us to buy more tickets? Literally, that was my first response. So um, you know, I'm going to give a lot of credit to Penny Forrester and her team. They have done a great job. Because when we first met with the Indians, it was not a sales pitch. They actually listened to what we wanted to try to accomplish in the community. And they put together and I, a bunch of ideas as how we could accomplish that. And it was not easy to convince the powers that be here at the firm that this was something that we should really do. But at the end of the day, it was something that we did because we believed in what the Indians have with the Community Partners Program. I don't know if a lot of people out here know, but without the Indians, there would not be baseball or softball within Cleveland Metropolitan School District. When I heard that, to me, that was something that really struck a chord, because if you're trying to make a difference in the communities that you work, um, this is something that's important. So kind of segueing off of that, Brian, how did that program get started? Because I think that that's one of the hidden gems that's in this community as far as how you're helping CMSD. It, it, uh, it got started many, many years ago. Uh, you know, Dennis Lehman, who's here with us today, uh, has, has been with the Indians for a really long time. Uh, and for as long as Dennis and, and other leaders have been in place, giving back in the community has been critically important. Uh, when the Dolan family bought the Indians in 2000, uh, the, the, the way the story goes is uh, Larry Dolan learned uh, through Bob DiBiasio that baseball and softball uh, were going to stop and other sports may stop for the, the boys and girls within CMSD. And uh, Larry's reaction was, I can't imagine not having the opportunity to participate in, in baseball or a sport as, as, a, as a child. Uh, we've got to get involved. And getting involved uh, from the Indians' perspective out of the blocks looked like financial support. Um, and the financial support came in the form of buying the equipment, uh, buying the uniforms, uh, helping uh, to identify coaches, providing those coaches with the uh, curriculum to, to teach and train not only the competencies on the field, but life lessons to you know, young boys and girls in the community. Um, and, and from that start, the, the program has uh, has continued to be a, a great success. Raphael Collins, who's here with us today, uh, actually was, was a product of that environment. Uh, Raph is, is one of our, our top folks within our corporate partnership business. Um, he played baseball. Uh, he was the player of the year back in the day within, uh, within CMSD. And those types of stories wouldn't be possible without that support from the Dolan family. I heard uh, Raph did a little arm twist and get enough people to play. Is that true? <laughs> so it, allegedly, Raph had to convince a couple of his friends, uh, you know, come out for the team. Even if, if you're not really a good baseball player, we have to have nine players to take the field and not forfeit games. Uh, and Raph is, is a pretty good salesperson. Uh, so he was able to, to, to do that. But it, it speaks volumes to the spirit of, of what the program was about for the Indians. It, it was not about trying to uh, field state championship softball and, and baseball teams. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's a scoreboard and people are going to compete. Um, but it was about providing an opportunity for young boys and girls, young men and women to learn the valuable lessons that come from competing in, in baseball or softball. Uh, there's a lot of failure. If, uh, if you miss two thirds of the question on a test, you're going to be taking the class again. If, if you hit a baseball or a softball one-third of the time and you do it for a really long time, you'll end up in the Hall of Fame. 
Um, so there's a lot of uh, failure that's, that's baked into the game. Uh, and it's less about the failure, it's about teaching the lessons of pick yourself up and be there to pick up your teammates and learn from those things and try and get better. Uh, there'll, there'll be another game, there'll be another at bat, there'll, there'll be another opportunity to try and learn and grow as an individual. And those lessons that take place on the field certainly transfer over into life. So besides CMSD, what other organizations benefit from the Indians' participation in these efforts? So there's a couple uh, that I would highlight. Uh, the RBI program um, is all about reviving baseball in inner cities. Uh, and this is a Major League Baseball sponsored sanctioned program. Uh, Cleveland Baseball Federation is, is another capability. Uh, you know, with the Boys and Girls Club, um, the Indians do quite a bit to uh, underwrite youth baseball and the Cleveland Baseball Federation. So recreational baseball that's played in the summer in, in Cleveland by young boys and girls within CMSD schools. Uh, they get their uniforms, they get their equipment, uh, you know, through the Indians. Uh, Dennis Lehman sits on the board of the Boys and Girls Club, uh, gives back and, and role models what it means for our leaders to participate actively in the community. Um, trying to help prepare the next generation to be successful in life. So teamwork is part of this, I, I can tell based on what you're trying to accomplish, but how are the educational components you know, fitting into this as well? Because I'm sure that that's a drive of the Indians as well to not only provide you know, sports, but also an educational aspect to it. You know, f first off and, and at the top of the list is that idea of learning lessons that go beyond the sport itself. Uh, it's, it's that concept of preparing and teamwork, uh, being there to help a teammate, uh, whether they, they have a challenge off the field or they experience you know, failure on the field. Um, these are things that, that are very important to us to start to develop within uh, children and starting to teach them those valuable lessons. Uh, the financial support obviously makes a difference. It makes, it makes it possible for kids to participate differently uh, and that's something that the Indians are committed to do, uh, you know, forever. Uh, have done, are doing, and will always do. Uh, it, it supersedes anything else from a financial obligation standpoint uh, because you're, you're giving back in a different way, trying to address some of the challenges that uh, will be generational and multi-generational in, in Cleveland as it relates to education and providing an opportunity to address uh, some of the root causes of poverty and an underemployed uh, marketplace. So I heard analytics are kind of important to the Indians. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> so the Indians use, use a lot of evidence and, and data in our decision-making process, yes. So I would imagine that you're evaluating these programs and seeing if they're successful. I mean, what can you tell us about that? So in the spirit of constantly learning and growing, uh, you know, we, we've had a program, Tribe Scholars, uh, you know, our, our, uh, my, my wife and I have children that are, uh, one's going to be a senior in college, the other one's out of college, and we lived in Cincinnati uh, a couple of times over the years with Procter & Gamble, and um, a lot of Major League Baseball teams will have these programs where if you do well in the classroom, you get tickets to go watch a game. Um, the Indians did that as well. It was called the Tribe Scholars Program. We, we have the Tribe Scholars Program to this day, um, but in the spirit of, of trying to take a good thing and make it better, uh, the Indians started to look at uh, the opportunity, not necessarily being the top students. Um, it was finding the younger kids in sixth through eighth grade uh, that, that might be uh, C and D students and actually incenting them through the tri Tribe Scholars Program to improve their attendance and their grades. And if, if you come to school and you participate and your grades improve, you'll get tickets to a baseball game. You'll get a chance to come down and walk around in the ballpark, et cetera. Um, we don't have the data from this past school year, uh, but in 2017-18, we had a little over 600 kids that participated in that program where the objective was show up to school on time um, and, and drive your attendance up and then take these uh, poor grades and improve them. Uh, over 80% of the kids actually were able to take C's and D's and turn them into A's and B's and reap the benefits of being in the Tribe Scholars Program. I remember growing up and delivering the Plain Dealer, I would 
if I had good grades, I could go to the Indians game. So it's the same type of thing mm -hmm. that you guys are accomplishing, which is great because a lot of these individuals wouldn't have the opportunity to go to an Indians game other but for that program. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. Um, so let's just, um, I'm going to go off script a little bit too because there's a couple questions that were submitted prior to the presentation that I just want to cover dealing with present. So we've talked a lot about youth baseball. Um, have you thought about moving into the college or university end of this at, at all in connection with providing any type of mentoring to those students as they go from CMSD to the college ranks? Mm -hmm. uh, we have, and, and we try and do that uh, by partnering through College Now and, and with uh, Eric Gordon and company with mentoring programs. Uh, so we have within our, our front office an expectation that all employees will do a minimum of four hours of community service. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to say that that's, that's an objective, that goal is exceeded uh, exponentially every year. Uh, it's part of the culture within the Indians to give back. Uh, we believe pretty firmly uh, the opportunities that you get as a mentor in college now. Uh, we've got a, over a dozen folks in our front office that are, that are mentors. We have another half a dozen that are in the True to You program. We're connecting with uh, younger boys and girls, men and women, and helping them through that journey. Um, my own personal learning uh, through college now, uh, grateful again to Dennis Lehman for identifying an area that, that was important to me personally and uh, knowing it would be a good fit within the community for me to be involved. Um, so I sit on the College Now board and play an, an active role in that. Uh, a lot of the kids uh, experience a lot of things for the first time in their life when they go to college. Uh, what is going to college? Like what is showing up on campus? Uh, do I have to wear a suit and tie? Uh, do I have to have a backpack? H how do I buy books? Uh, things that a lot of us might take for granted are things that they're going through for the first time in their lives. So being a mentor, uh, you know, t some of the questions are not now, so what should I be doing right now to prepare myself for the next? It's, it's a different set of, of questions uh, and, and a great reminder, uh, go get folks where they are and uh, invest in them, understand what they're trying to do with their lives and, and be there to kind of coach and guide them through things that they're experiencing for the first time. Uh, many of us probably experienced that when we got to college or we got into the working world and you know what it's like when you show up as the new person on the project team, uh, y you have a little bit of anxiety. Uh, you know, m multiply that by, you know, a thousand. Uh, that's what a lot of these, these young men and women are experiencing when they show up on a college campus. So we try and give back in the form of uh, mentoring and staying in touch with those kids to guide them through that process. That's great. So. Here's a question from the audience, so I'm going to hit you up with this one because it's a pretty good one. So could you talk more about the CLE Indians' recent in initiatives with the data science competitions, looking at analytics? Uh, as someone who works closely with high school and college students, I'm always looking for ways to make data anal and analytics relevant to students. We are really, really fortunate um, uh, that we build a capability from a business perspective uh, that frankly had to catch up with, with baseball operations. Uh, you know, I can remember my first meeting with, with Mark Shapiro in 2010. He asked me to come up and experience a, a game with him so I could spend some time with the baseball operations and the baseball business operations and provide feedback. Um, and at the end of a day, uh, you know, in, in full transparency, I said, I, I spent a half a day with the Jetsons and a half a day with the Flintstones. <laughs> the, 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 the big difference was the data and the information and the accuracy of that to make evidence-based decisions in, in baseball from a player personnel standpoint. Um, and a lot of the architecture and the infrastructure from a system standpoint um, wasn't quite as advanced from a business operations perspective. So we've invested in that space the last few years from a leadership standpoint uh, Neil Weiss, our Chief Information Officer, Alex King, who's actually here with us today, leads our marketing and strategy team, uh, Nikki Schmidt, who, who leads our brand strategy analytics team. Uh, I talked about the experience at Procter & Gamble of pulling in the parking lot and getting an opportunity to learn. Uh, that's what I get with the Indians, with, with our team. Uh, we have built a, a capability uh, 
very rapidly to gather information, uh, get it into you know, a common data warehouse where it's clean, and you can pull that information. Uh, having, having data uh, is not a competitive advantage. Uh, transforming it into knowledge and framing choices for leaders and making decisions on faster cycle time, that's, that's actually cooking with gas. And, and that's what we're trying to do as an organization. We're young and, and learning in that process, um, but we make objective database decisions as best we can. Uh, you know, in, in a business that, uh, you know, a few of us, uh, Penny and Tim and I, are, are watching at 12.34 in the morning last night, uh, Jason Kipnis hit a walk-off home run. Uh, you know, there's a lot of emotion that, that comes with uh, people are in a better mood this morning because we won a game last night in extra innings. Uh, kind of have to separate that emotion from the moment that comes from a professional sports team and stay focused on your task at hand of gathering information, uh, teaching and training and developing the organization to util utilize that information to make better fact-based decisions. That was one of the questions I was supposed to ask you. What time did you leave the ballpark last night? <laughs> so I, 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 Tim and Penny and I, and my, my wife was there. She, she's a competitor. She likes to watch the games. Uh, we looked at the clock, and I, it was 1240 when we were turning off the lights in the conference room uh, and heading back into the front office to our cars. So it was the late one last night, uh, but that kind of goes with the territory. We, we talk a lot about controlling the controllables. Uh, you know, from a business standpoint, we can't control the weather uh, and we can't control team performance. So we, we roll with the weather uh, and last night was a rather extensive rain delay. Uh, and, you know, team performance is, is something that our baseball operations team is uh, laser focused on. They're, they're worried about that 24-7 uh, and then we're worried about creating as much flexibility to field a, a competitive team in a, in a smaller market as, as we possibly can and together, you know, we, we try and work as a team to do things that uh, maybe haven't been done before. Since we're talking about analytics, I'm going to go off of the topic and talk about baseball for a minute. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that got asked was, what steps are the Indians taking to attract new fans to the ballpark, especially in the 13 to 31 age group? That's a, a great question. Uh, you know, the, the, the learning transferability from uh, the opportunity over the years at, at Procter & Gamble to start with your who and, and understanding uh, who, in, in this instance, who our fan is and, and what their needs are, both the ones that they can articulate and the ones that they can't. Uh, you can pull out through market research quantitatively some of those unarticulated needs. Um, for us, over the course of the last few years, we've taken some steps to uh, reduce capacity in the ballpark uh, from you know, 43 to 44,000 to about 34 to 35,000. Uh, in conjunction with reducing capacity, uh, we took seats out and gave them back uh, in the form of standing room only spaces. Uh, instead of filling those spaces with lots of stuff, we left the space for fans to actually move around and interact with one another. Uh, for, for those that have been to the ballpark uh, in the last couple of years, the corner bar is probably a, a good example of uh, the dichotomy between the, the dilemma in Major League Baseball and, and Cleveland is a microcosm of that. Um, for those of us that, that are in the 50 plus group, uh, we're not the target audience for the corner bar. And uh, w when we do research uh, and, and sometimes host some of our, our corporate partners, uh, we'll go there before a game and, and explain what we did and I uh, get great feedback. You know, you need to do more to tell us about this. And without trying to offend anybody, I, I kind of look and say, I think we're kind of around the same age. We're not in the target audience. Uh, <laughs> maybe our children are that are over 21, but uh, that's exactly how the space was designed. Um, the, the older diehard baseball fan who's looking for a number two lead pencil and, and a scorecard is literally dying. Um, and, and like any business, you've got to go find that point of market entry and replenish. And that point of market entry for us is that 13 to 30. It's, it's, it's getting those younger children to come with their family, uh, experience the, the ballpark and the game, the memories, uh, the opportunity to connect with their family across generations um, as they progress through, through the years where uh, they may be able to come to the game and go to the corner bar. Uh, they're networked very differently. Uh, 
you know, our, our two, two uh, sons are, are networked differently than my wife and I were when, when we were growing up. Uh, in, in a matter, decisions are made on much shorter cycle time. Uh, a lot of communication in, in uh, applications that, you know, I, can, I don't even know what the names of them are anymore. Uh, but they're planning together. What are we going to do? And who's going to be there? And we'll all meet in a certain space or area. And the idea of being in an assigned seat versus being able to walk around and move from one group to another is, is a great example of the insight and the design of a space that actually works backwards from the insight versus we should do it like this. Well, why? Well, that's how the architects recommended it. What do you think the fan would like? Um, and we need to really understand that and build our product offering um, based on that insight. Great. So let's transition to the future. Um, so like every organization, I'm sure the Indians have short-term and long-term goals, especially as it relates to your initiatives like education. So as it relates to uh, your short-term goals, um, we've heard a lot about the Major League Baseball All-Star Legacy projects. Uh, can you give a little insight as to how those pro who decided those projects and how are you going to bring them to life in the next uh, six months or a couple weeks? So uh, you, you get a lot of help uh, from the league in deciding those projects, and, <laughs> and you also get some input. Um, we have the benefit of uh, a handful, and, and again, Dennis Lehman is one who was here for an all-star game in the 90s uh, in the planning and the execution of that, and, and he's here today uh, helping us do this along with, with Curtis Danberg. Um, Major League Baseball has, has taken advantage of basically uh, the midsummer classic is, is a time where things are generally slowing down. Kids are done with school. Uh, it, it, you're in a little bit of a lull before a new school year may start up. Uh, it, it's, it's undivided attention uh, for a, a crown jewel event for baseball. Uh, back in the 90s, it was very important uh, and, and the first time the Indians, uh, well, not the first time, this is the sixth All-Star game that the Indians have hosted, uh, but the one that we hosted in the 90s, um, Major League Baseball was focused on legacy projects and leaving something behind in the community. Uh, as they came back for the All-Star game and the planning process, they said, let's take a look at some of the things that we did back in the 90s. Um, you know, one of the things that we did was, was go and refresh uh, some playgrounds. Uh, for a few CMSD schools. And the league said, we need to go back and, and do that again. Uh, and the, the league will end up uh, leaving behind uh, somewhere in the neighborhood between the league and, and ownership from the Indians about $5 million worth of legacy projects um, that refresh the playgrounds was one that didn't count towards the $5 million. The league was committed to, uh, to doing that because it's the right thing to do. Um, we've got four big projects that uh, will be part of in the community along with Major League Baseball uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. Each of them will have a, a formal ribbon cutting, so to speak, around the All-Star game. Um, the first one is an All-Star Student Veterans Center at Baldwin Wallace. Uh, BW has about 90 veterans uh, who, who are working their way through college right now. Some may have had a delayed start. Some may be serving as they're working their way through school. Um, as, as someone who personally did that, uh, that's really important. It gives them an opportunity to network with one another. They're going through a different experience than perhaps some of the other uh, students on campus. So we've invested in uh, refurbishing a house where they can come and gather uh, and, and work uh, and, and have some fun together. Um, we've, we've taken two different uh, baseball fields uh, at Luke Easter Park uh, and at Brookside and we put in turf fields. Uh, you know, that idea of insight driving a, a series of choices. Uh, the number one reason that, that kids weren't coming back to play youth baseball in, in Cleveland was because they weren't playing games. And they weren't playing games because the fields are underwater. Um, you know, as the earth thaws up here, uh, you know, that baseball sticks in the mud for most of the month of, of May and, and June. Um, and when we do get rain, uh, and we certainly had a lot in the last week, um, providing turf fields uh, with good drainage where it really doesn't matter unless there's lightning, you're going to be able to play a baseball game. Um, so we've been able to actually get two, uh, 
two big fields done where you can play baseball or softball. Uh, and that's a very important project, again, to, to bring kids into a game where hopefully they can learn lessons about life and success is that they want to come back and play baseball or softball a year from now, not that they made you know, the, the all-star team within their league. Um, the last one is an all-star digital arts suite um, that we're working with the Boys and Girls Club um, at East Tech. And uh, this is another one where uh, technology, uh, providing a place, a gathering place and space for kids to get together uh, and, and do things that are important to them. Uh, there probably won't be a lot of baseball uh, or softball in that space, and that's okay. Uh, it's about providing an opportunity to bring those, those kids together, provide them with the resources and the tools. Um, if they need counseling, uh, if they need help with anything, uh, those, those spaces and places turn into safe havens for them uh, where they can network with one another and get the guidance from the resources that uh, the, the city and the county provide to them. It's a lot going on, huh? You're going to have to get it. So <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be impressive to get it all done in a short period mm -hmm. of time. So um, the, it's clear that the Indians have a lot going on and the community are entrenched here. So I guess from a long-term perspective, uh, where do you see the organization going in connection with uh, different initiatives or different things that you're going to focus on for both uh, softball and baseball going forward and the educational component? We, we see the continued investment in uh, CMSD from a uh, underwriting of, of the youth, uh, the, the high school boys and girls uh, baseball and softball, and then Cleveland Baseball Federation on the recreational baseball front. Um, one of the things that, that the league has actually been undertaking um, it are urban youth academies, and they're Major League Baseball urban youth academies. Uh, there are about eight to ten cities that have them today, and this is something that we're interested in, in exploring. Um, the good news is uh, our, our friends right down I-71 in Cincinnati uh, ha have a wonderful academy, uh, and we, we know the Reds, and off the field, uh, the collaboration with, with front offices is exceptionally high uh, from a business perspective. We're not, we're not competing for the same fans, and no one's trying to decide, am I going to go watch the Los Angeles Angels tonight or the Cleveland Indians? Uh, they're going to go to the games that are in their marketplace. Um, these urban academies are, are typically a, a combination or a confluence of a couple of things. Uh, it's, it's building out a physical space where there are baseball fields, uh, softball fields, um, as, as well as uh, a, a building where there, there's a classroom or a series of classrooms. Uh, the, the building can help you in the winter time with an indoor baseball field like an infield, some batting cages, things to work on the skills related to softball and baseball, but then classroom uh, to, to help kids actually prepare for life and provide the resources within that space that, that help them do that uh, and achieve their full potential. Uh, as we spent time with the Reds, it's a little bit of a, a home game. The Reds Academy uh, was actually uh, built by several large companies in Cincinnati and Procter & Gamble was, was a big one in that process of sinking the capital and developing the physical plant um, and then the development of fields partnering with the city of Cincinnati to do that. Uh, you, you can run your RBI programs, uh, your competitive travel softball and, and baseball teams in that RBI program the Indians actually underwrite all the travel costs for the boys and girls that play on those teams. And those are competitive uh, softball and, and, and baseball teams at the high school level. Um, it can be a facility for those kids and more. And when I say and more, um, for kids that may be trying to make that team, where the success is, is not I made the team, the success is they come to the Urban Academy and they're exposed to an environment where they can learn and interact with, uh, with other boys and girls that frankly are going through a lot of the same things in life that they are. Uh, so we see that as an opportunity here within, within the Cleveland community. Um, the, the, the capital to build it, uh, the ongoing operating expense, M my last assignment at Procter & Gamble before I came to the Indians uh, was actually working collaboratively with, with Kroger who was a backyard partner of Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. You could walk back and forth between the headquarters. Uh, Kroger and Procter & Gamble basically uh, 
play an integral role together in underwriting the costs, the operating costs to run the academy every year, to heat the building, uh, to, to get the right staffing within the building, um, oftentimes social services that, that provide the guidance for the kids uh, in ways that those that are interested in helping can't really help. Uh, they, they may not have the proper training or certification to do that. Um, you can also use the facility uh, with your players when they come in in the off season. Uh, the Reds certainly do that down in Cincinnati. Other teams have done similar things. So we see that as an opportunity for us to, I would say, you know, t take it to the next level in, in Cleveland. Um, it'll, be, it'll be challenging for a whole host of reasons. Um, we take a long view on things like that, not necessarily looking at, you know, what's our internal rate of return, uh, what's our year's payback, you know, like a traditional capital project, um, but, it, but we're going to need to build that out in a way that's, that's financially uh, uh, attractive for, for us as well as for partners within the community. So to put you on the spot, what are the odds of you think it occurring here in Cleveland? I, I would put the odds. Uh, so that's that's a loaded question, Dave, because <laughs> well, with me, I got to give you a as, one hard as, question. As our team has learned, uh, anything is possible. Uh, so I would put the odds at greater than ninety percent, okay. uh, and, and I say that uh, with authenticity. Uh, it's going to be hard. Everything is hard. Uh, the most worthwhile things in life are hard. Uh, you know, one of the things that I personally enjoy about um, being back in Cleveland is uh, uh, that that's part of the culture. In, in Cleveland, uh, nothing's handed to you. You got to work for everything, and uh, we're not looking for handouts from one another. Uh, you can make fun of Cleveland if you're from Cleveland. If you're not, you know, lock the door <laughs> because it, that's that's our own thing to do with each other. Um, so it, it will be a challenging thing, and that's the type of of opportunity that we're going to look at uh, very very thoughtfully with with partners and uh, you know wide open to exploring what it looks like. And I'll, I'll close with this. So our, our community partners program, uh, as it exists today, and, and we're grateful to McDonald Hopkins and our other community partners, is a great example of, of taking a concept from a different industry, uh, failing miserably, and then learning from it. So cause-related marketing is something that Procter & Gamble does really well. Uh, f for me personally, it was, this is going to be a no-brainer. We're going to figure this thing out in, you know, 90 days. Uh, Ted Baugh is here with us today, uh, can attest. We, we made many calls together uh, and probably failed 40 or 50 times. Uh, and, and we just couldn't seem to get the kind of traction in the, in the program that we were hoping that we could get. Uh, Penny Forster, uh, who you mentioned before, actually said, you know, I, I think if uh, we, we change this and, and we move this around and, and we frame it this way, that the program can work. Uh, and if you look up in right field uh, uh, where we took out some seats, we actually have facades, and McDonald Hopkins is, is one of them, of our community partners. Uh, and it's a great example of a program that out of the blocks, uh, you know, we were hoping to catch the wind as the plane was coming to the runway, and we weren't catching it, uh, but we kept trying. Uh, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight. You know, we fell down 45 or 50 times, um, but we kept getting up and trying and we learned our way to a, a program that's, that's sustaining today. Before we wrap up, I do have one other baseball question for you. So, can't resist. Um, so how's the All-Star Week going? How's the All-Star Week going? You know, it, we, we, we were sitting in a meeting uh, the other day and said, you know, the All-Star Game's gonna be here in uh, two weeks. And, and it's been, the All-Star Game is coming in 2019 uh, for a couple years, and now it's, it's on top of us. Uh, it's, it's going well. Uh, as the team wraps up a, a homestand against the Kansas City Royals, uh, uh, they head out on the road, and Major League Baseball has started to, to come into town, uh, and, and they'll be in here in full force uh, you know, within the next five to seven days. Uh, a lot of intense planning, uh, and, and frankly, a lot of execution. The planning and the collaboration on the front end has taken place over the course of really the last year. Um, and it's, it's go time. So lots of exciting stuff that'll be happening uh, in the community. Uh, downtown Cleveland, it really excited the work that, you know, David Gilbert is, is a champion of so many things, uh, you know, within the broader community. Uh, winning a bid for the All-Star Game is a big deal. Uh, we'll have over 10,000 volunteers from the community. Uh, 
The economic impact will be somewhere in the 65 to $70 million range. Uh, the league is very excited about the walkability uh, and, and how great downtown Cleveland is. We had the opportunity to go to Washington last summer. The, the All-Star Game was in Washington, D.C. It's in Los Angeles next summer with the Dodgers. Uh, you know, several of us got on a bus to go from one activity to another uh, sometime around 5 o'clock in D.C. And, it, you know, eight-tenths of a mile took about an hour and a half. Uh, we'll be able to walk everywhere downtown. And uh, we can't control the weather. We're hoping for good things on the weather front. Uh, but a, a lot of exciting things that, that will start uh, a, about a week before the All-Star Game. Uh, Sunday, you get a celebrity All-Star Game and a Futures Game where the future prospects of, of baseball uh, play against one another. Monday's the Home Run Derby, and Tuesday is the All-Star Game itself. So some exciting things coming our way. So what's your greatest hope for the All-Star Game? Uh, that, that we have a week of really good weather. <laughs> and, if it, and if it rains, it happens at night, <laughs> not during the day and after the All-Star Game itself. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, you said something early on which is near and dear to my heart. Um, you said everything happens for a reason, and the people at the firm know that that's one of my favorite sayings, because we wouldn't be where we are unless something happens, and everything does happen for a reason. And when you look at it from you know, your dad, who had a significant impact on your belief that education is key to a successful career, um, then at your time at Princeton, um, you learn that education coupled with teamwork leads to success for all. Then at P&G, it's clear that you mastered uh, the concept that education plus teamwork equals success to run a $9 billion business. And now with the Indians, you have taken that knowledge to a community you now call home, and you are making a difference in the lives of youth in Northeast Ohio. And because of that, that's why we believe you're one of the leaders in education in Northeast Ohio. So thank you. Thank you very and much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So before you leave, I got a swag bag, and I got to show you one thing in the swag bag. So now you're part of our team, which is our community partner T-shirt wow. with McDonald Hopkins on the back. Thank so, you very much. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. That's outstanding. So finally, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we will be sending out a survey, so if you could respond to that survey and only give Brian fives, I don't care what you give me, because you know, he deserves it. Um, he did the heavy uh, lifting on this. Um, we will also have a replay on the website if you want to see it. And then um, also, um, our next uh, session will be with Alec Johnson, who is the president of Tri-C, and that will be in September. Uh, we're confirming the date, and we'll have that out as soon as possible. So. Thank you for attending. Brian, thank you. This thank you was very, very much insightful. For the so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.